After more than six years, the record for the fastest series production car has finally been broken. For years, that title belonged to the Bugatti Chiron Super Sport 300 Plus, a French combustion engine car. But now the fastest car comes from China and is an electric car. And that's never happened before. An electric car that is the world's fastest production vehicle. Today, we will explain how fast the electrical car drove to break the record, why electric cars generally have an advantage at high speeds and how the fastest car in the world took advantage of that. And with that, welcome to the German science guy. I'm Dr. Jakob Botton and in Germany, we say Los geht's. On September 14th, a world record was broken in Germany. On the test track in Papenburg, Yang Wang, a sub-brand of BYD, set a new global top speed record for production vehicles. This speed was simply 496.22 km per hour, or for my American friends, 308.34 miles per hour. By way of comparison, in Formula 1, we are talking about an average speed of around 250 km per hour, or 155 miles per hour, and a top speed of around 370 to 380 kilometers per hour, so around 230 to 236 miles per hour. So I find it really hard to imagine that a production car could now be that fast and it's totally crazy somehow. In any case, a race car driver was behind the wheel at BYD and he himself says that this record would only have been possible for him with an electric car. We will take a closer look at exactly what he is referring to in a moment and what might be a problem about this, but let's first address the question of why electric cars have an advantage in terms of their drive system alone. Let's start with the combustion engine. It is constructed as follows. We have the engine which burns gasoline or diesel and the heat released by this combustion is converted into kinetic energy. More precisely, it is converted into rotary motion. This rotary motion is ultimately transferred to the tires and the car starts to move. That is the basic principle. But of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that because the rotary motion cannot really be transmitted directly, at least not in combustion engines and it shouldn't be because combustion engines only work efficiently within a certain speed range. This means that depending on the model, they should only rotate 2000 to 3000 times per minute because anything else would not only be inefficient, but also could be harmful to the engine. However, in order to achieve higher speeds without damaging the engine, there is the transmission. The transmission is located between the engine and the wheels and consists of several gears of different sizes. Depending on which gear you select, they connect and move. You can see this clearly with a bicycle because the way it works is actually the same. For example, when I'm riding up a hill, I shift into first gear and it's easier because I have to pedal more, so move the chain more for one round of the wheel, but I need less power so I can ride up the hill more easily. And it's the same with the car. The reason lies in the gear ratio. In first gear, the transmission in the car uses the configuration with the smallest gear in front and the largest gear in the back. This means that the engine has to be faster, but you need much less power to do so. The transmission converts the high speed into high traction or high torque. So you sacrifice speed for a multiplication of the force applied in order to overcome the resistance of the hill or the weight of the car when starting off, like a long lever that can easily move a large load. If you then get faster over time and the wheels gets faster, you shift into second gear and so on. By shifting gears, you always stay in the ideal speed range for the engine simply by changing the gears. Of course, this is a very simplified explanation, but at least it's a basis. And the complexity of this can be seen in the number of individual parts in a car. In fact, a combustion engine consists of over 1200 parts, which is really striking when you compare it to an electric car. On average, an electric car consists of fewer than 200 parts. This is mainly due to one difference. An electric car does not need a multi-stage transmission. This is because the electrical energy is transferred to the tires with all almost no mechanical detours. You can imagine it like this. In its basic design, a classic electric motor consists of a rotor and a stator. The rotor consists of a coil, so a wire that is wound several times, and the stator is a permanent magnet. As soon as the car starts moving, electricity flows through the coil, creating a magnetic field. This magnetic field is created at virtually every turn and the fields then reinforce each other and align themselves so that the coil can be viewed as a bar magnet. 
The opposite poles of the rotor and the stator then attract each other. This means that the rotor begins to rotate until the two opposite poles are very close to each other and then the whole thing is reversed. The direction of the current is reversed, the poles now repel each other and overall this mode of operation ensures that the rotor remains in constant motion. And the crucial thing is that the speed range in which an electric motor can operate efficiently is extremely wide, so there is no need for a transmission between the motor and the wheels as in the case with the combustion engines. This eliminates many components and a lot of complexity, which is also reflected in the efficiency. At around 65%, it is almost twice as high as that of a conventional combustion engine, at least a gasoline engine. The maximum efficiency of a gasoline engine is around 30 to 35%. For diesel engines, it's around 45%. Another advantage of electric cars is their acceleration. Because they don't need a transmission, their maximum torque is available immediately. I've even sat in the car with the fastest acceleration in the world myself, by the way, and I can confirm it is crazy. By the way, feel free to click on subscribe so you don't miss any more videos like this one. But now let's talk about the BYD car with a new world record. They have provided more detailed reasons for the record. Reason number one. Aerodynamics. The car was specifically designed to break records. This can be seen, for example, in the low front end. The car drives very low to the ground, which is intended to minimize air resistance. The car also has extra air channels integrated into it. This means that the air is directed along certain areas while driving. This is intended to make the car more stable, which brings us directly to the second point, traction. This is incredibly important when we are talking about such high speeds. BYD relies on two key elements for grip. First, the rear section, this is active, which means that it can automatically adjust depending on the speed and driving situation. It can flatten itself for even less air resistance, or it can extend fully to press the car more firmly to the ground in fast corners, for example. BYD has also fitted special tires to the car for extra grip. These are GT Sports eGTR2 Pro semi-slicks, which according to the manufacturer are designed for speeds of up to 500 km per hour, making them perfect for record-breaking speeds. And now the third point, performance. The record-breaking car has a quad motor drive. This means that each wheel is powered by its own electric motor, resulting in more precise power distribution, making the car faster and more stable. And each motor has incredible power. That's 450 kilowatts per wheel for a total output of 2220 kilowatt which is simply three times as much as a Formula One car. It should be noted however that the total output of the U9 Extreme is only this high for the record. The standard version has only 960 kilowatt but even that would still be more than a Formula One car which has an output of around 735 kilowatts. No wonder then that a race car driver was behind the wheel of the car when the record was set. He himself also mentions another reason for the record, the fourth and final point which I found somewhat surprising to be honest. He says that it helped him that the car had no load changes, meaning it didn't jerk or anything, but also that he was able to concentrate much better on the track because an electric car is so much quieter. And I'm not entirely sure if there's a physical reason why this might not be the case, which I will address in a moment in my big hurdle of the video. In any case, the U9 Extreme car is now supposed to be available in serious production, but that statement is also a little misleading because there's supposed to be a maximum unit of 30. And that brings me directly to the big hurdle for today, the part in the video where we look at the critical points of an innovation or here a record. And I want to be honest, today it's actually quite small. And the main big hurdle is on fact that BYD's record has not yet been independently verified. But hear me out. It was the same with Bugatti. According to the rules, in order to be officially designated to the fastest production car, two runs in opposite directions are required. However, BYD and Bugatti only achieved their speeds with runs in one direction. Of course, this has to do with factors such as possible inclines in the track or wind conditions. Nevertheless, I think we can say that the U9 Extreme is currently the fastest production car. In any case, the Bugatti was also perceived by the public as the fastest car in the world. However, another statement made me more skeptical, namely the one about the noise level for the driver. So the fact is that above 35 km per hour, the tire noise is louder than the engine. 
And yes, this applies to classic cars on road traffic, so around us in the public. And it's certainly different for race cars. I mean, the motors are louder, but it can't have been completely quiet in the car either. And so I was a little bit surprised about this reason. But as I said, these are very, very small hurdles. And I think it's really amazing what progress has been made here. But what do you think about it? Feel free to write your thoughts in the comments. And here you can find another video. It's crazy. It's about a German engine that is also very, very efficient. It's also an electric engine. And yeah, it's very special. Take a look at it. And thank you again for watching. I say Auf Wiedersehen, which means goodbye in German. Have a good day. Hab einen guten Tag. See you.